Looks like we are live, so let me welcome everybody. How are you today? Thank you for joining us. Uh, if you've tuned into one of these uh, Artist Works Live in the past, you might recognize me. I'm John Graves, the director of Artist or the director of uh, operations here at Artist Works. Uh, I want to welcome you guys to this month's Artist Works Live, where we're going to be talking with Hugh Sung, our online popular piano teacher. Um, we're going to be taking questions from you, the audience. So go ahead and get those ready now. Start sending them in. And uh, if you include your student name with your question, then you'll qualify to win a little prize that we're going to be giving away at the end of the broadcast today. So make sure to do that. Um, okay, so our guest this month is Hugh Sung, who debuted with the Philadelphia Orchestra at age 11, then studied with the prestigious uh, Curtis Institute, where he went on to become the director of instrumental accompaniment and its world-renowned student uh, recital series. He's one of the founders of Airturn, a company that develops in innovative technologies for musicians. Uh, and he's the producer and host of A Musical Life, which is a great weekly podcast that shares stories about making music. He started teaching online popular piano at Artist Works in December of 2014. And he's still going strong, and we're happy to hear, have him here today with us. Hi, Hugh. How are you? I'm good, John. Good to see you. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for joining us. This is, uh, this is really going to be – I'm really looking forward to this one. Um, we know you have an insane schedule, and especially uh, around this time of the year with the holidays coming up, but we're really thankful that you found some time to carve us in. Sure. I'm so sorry about my friend. Uh, Rich was supposed to join us. You might want to mention something about that, but yeah. Right. So Rich um, Galassini, I believe is how you say his last name. He's the yeah. co-owner co of Cunningham Pianos there in Philadelphia. and He really was looking forward to joining us today and lending some of his, his uh, unique expertise. But he unfortunately had a last minute uh, personal emergency and wasn't able to to join us. But uh, I'm still feeling optimistic and excited about this. I think Hugh has enough knowledge and, and <laughs> inside of that brain of his to keep us all entertained for an hour. No, I don't know. It's feeling kind of empty right now, but I'm working <laughs> on one, right? There we go. Let's just see what's, what's still rattling around in there. Yeah, chug some of that coffee. Give yourself a little... Yeah, little yeah. Beer. Oh, my God. I just made a fresh, <laughs> fresh cup for myself. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, let me quickly remind the viewers that today's questions are going to be coming solely from you guys. Um, although time may only permit, permit to get to a small amount of these, um, start sending them in now. We're going to hit as many as possible. Um, include your student name with your question, like I said, and you'll qualify to, for a little prize we're going to be giving away at the end of today's broadcast. Uh, it's going to be a great hour. I'm really excited. So while those questions start rolling in, I'm going to ask Mr. Hugh Sung here if he'll start us off with a little song to get us ready for a discussion on all things piano and music. Okay, well, listen, I, I, I'm throwing something together at the last second. I'm basically reading this, so <laughs> this is something I'm going to play just to get us in the mood for the holidays. So um, you may have heard this in elevators and shopping malls. If you haven't started to yet, you will soon. Uh, I'll be very curious to see if any of your, um, your listeners or your, watch, your viewers recognize this piece I'm going to play. I'm not going to tell you what it is. Here you go. <laughs> Thank you. 
this sound familiar? It sounds familiar to me, yes. Yeah, so that's one of the selections from Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker Suite. So this is where ballerinas and uh, are all getting ready right now. So this is like perfect holiday season music. So and I know it's not Thanksgiving yet, but we're close enough. So I thought I'd give us a little bit of holiday music. <laughs> yes, very beautiful. I had the pleasure of seeing the Nutcracker uh, here in San Francisco as a, as a kid, I think I was in fifth or sixth grade or something. We went on a field trip and went out there, and I still remember it till this day. It was very beautiful. Hey, very, very cool. For, I, for actually, young... I was actually up in New York, and I was hearing a, a young pianist play through it, so, and it just reminded me that Tchaikovsky had actually written this arrangement for solo piano. It's like, wow, this is so much fun. So I got a copy of it, and I've just been having fun just playing around with it just for, just for kicks. Very cool, very cool. All right, so I'm gonna. These questions are rolling in. Thanks to the viewers for already getting get started participating. Uh, I'm gonna get to a couple of these. So uh, Abigail is asking. Um, this is a great question. I've been playing piano for about six years. How do you stay motivated and excited about piano in the day to day mundane practice routine? You know, that's a great question. And yeah. I, for me, what I always go back to is the fact that try to work in things that you love. Um, the hardest thing many times, especially if you're an older learner getting into music, is working, if you're working on exercises or you're working on things that you really don't enjoy, I would encourage you to have the courage to ask your teacher to switch it up. Um, I've worked with so many students who have accomplished incredible things because they were motivated by the songs they really, really love. So that love has to be there. If, if you're playing something that you like and you're getting tired of it, then I would recommend having at least one or two other pieces that totally light you up that you can rotate through. So uh, really look for the things that you really love to play and don't feel like you have to just stick with your teacher's regimen. I always encourage my students, hey, if you need to change it up, just ask and we'll, we'll modify the, uh, the curriculum for you. You don't have to do it in the order that I present because I feel like my job as a teacher is to serve the students and because I know personally, if I force a student to do something they don't like, I'm not going to get very good results. But if I help them at least see why there's a benefit for it, better yet, if I'm helping them play pieces that they absolutely love, oh my goodness, they accomplish the most incredible things. I've seen people, especially older adults, who have never played the piano before, play the most difficult things because that their love of that song completely motivates them and they see why they have to work on it. And they, they just, they're having fun. So don't forget to have fun, work on things that you love and have the courage to talk to your teacher to switch it up and find things that really get you excited. Very cool. So one of the things I really love about this question is, you know, it's not just pianists uh, tuning in right now. We have musicians from all across all artists works, schools watching. So, and I think this is a question that applies to somebody of any instrument. Um, so you're, you're talking about focusing on a piece or something that you really love and on fire about. Do you suggest that um, someone come to you when start, when attempting to choose something that they're on fire about or can anybody really just play anything if they're kind of being focusing on it the right way? I think there are a lot of different options you can explore. Certainly, if, if there's an existing piece that you're really excited about um, that you want to approach your teacher with, I think a great teacher will always find a way to make it work for you. You know, the, one of the creative options that I develop for some of my students, if they are working on a piece that I know is a little beyond what they can play and they have the potential to play it, I'll actually write an arrangement specifically suited for their ability, excuse me, their ability level. So, um, hey, if you've got a teacher that's creative enough and energized enough to do something like that, you know you've got a great teacher, right? So, okay. and the, other, the other thing I would kind of encourage all students across all platforms, because um, people are gonna be working on a variety of things, I would actually suggest you practice less. Now, here's, you know, hear me out. So instead of just woodshedding, you know, an hour, two hours a day and just getting yourself frustrated, take 10 minutes, just 10 minutes and find one thing to fix in those 10 minutes. And after those 10 minutes, you can either stop or give yourself a break and come back for another 10 minute session. But the reason for that is when you are, when you almost uh, purposely limit your time and attention, 
you gave yourself greater focus and more importantly you're thinking okay here's a lick that I'm really having a hard time with and you look at the exact breakpoint where is it actually falling apart and you focus just on that one spot if you can work on that for just 10 minutes I guarantee I think anybody across all instrument categories no matter what you're playing you're going to re realize oh wow it's getting better but 10 minutes at a time not an hour at a time if you're practicing an hour and nothing's being accomplished you're wasting your time, and if anything, you're probably ingraining bad habits. You're probably playing it the wrong way over and over, and it's going to get even harder to rewire or reprogram your brain to do it the right way. I hope that makes sense. Wow, that's great information. That's really interesting. Well, so while we're on the topic, another question rolled in that's on a similar topic, topic about practicing. Um, it is from, uh, let's see. From Michael Newman is saying, please describe uh, what a well-focused practice routine and schedule should include. So you've already started to touch on that, just kind of 10-minute chunks at a time. Is there anything you would kind of add to answer that question from Michael? You know, it's interesting because for me, my time is so limited between all the concerts I have to play and all the all the engagements I have to appear at. Right. And so, uh, especially um, one of the things I started to come up with, especially because I use digital sheet music. I would create what I call PJs, practice journals. So here's let me let me gonna give you the the timeline of how I would work on a piece and practice it and get it performance ready. So the first one or two times that I get a brand new piece, I would read through the whole thing slowly, and then purposely, of course, with my digital setup, I could take snapshots of the spots that I'm having problems with. You can do this on an iPad too. And if you don't have an iPad, you're not using digital sheet music, you buy, you invest in one of those um, post-it tabs. These are the post-it notes, but cut into really thin slivers, okay? And you just get hundreds of them. And every time you come across a spot, you just stick a post-it tab on the page, roughly according to where you're working on, okay? Um, mm -hmm. And so that would be one spot. And if you're working off of an audio file, you're not reading music, you know, you can use a lot of different programs to create bookmarks and create bookmarks on the licks that you know are really, really hard that you're trying to, to learn. It's just, the concept is the same. You find and bookmark the hardest parts and you make a map of those parts. And so what I would do then in subsequent practice sessions, instead of just playing from the beginning to the end, mm -hmm. I would purposely just attack just the hard spots. Maybe however many spots I had time to do and each time I mastered it I'd remove this the sticky tab or the 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 entry in my practice journal and eventually I'd have almost a checklist of things I need to work on and you know by the time I rotate it and I don't always hit all the practice spots all at once maybe I'll only hit two or three of them at a time but as I kind of systematically work through them and then every once in a while put it back in with the whole song or the whole piece I would find myself oh things are moving much smoother does that make sense? So it's it's a it's yeah. alternating between this really focused section practice with the whole thing as review that you just do once in a while. Instead of what I see a lot of students sometimes do is they just play through the whole thing over and over again without having a clue where to work. Really try to see if you can create bookmarks in, in any format, whether virtual or physical, so that you know exactly what you need to work on. You put your attention right to that. Right. So I, that seems like it's a time efficiency thing, but it also probably makes a piece a lot, a piece a lot more approachable, I would imagine. Absolutely. I mean, that, that's the whole point, too. I mean, you, you don't, a good teacher and a good teacher-student relationship will actually make the learning faster. And this is one of the things that I found so remarkable with Artisworks. I mean, I, I really believe that this platform it, it improves on learning music better faster I mean just, it, there's so many improvements because we're very efficient in terms of isolating what we need to work on and helping everybody make great progress and of course being able to watch yourself to review your own mistakes that's another way of bookmarking or of putting those little reminders oh I need to work on that because now you're objectively listening to what's working or not working and of course with your teachers feedback it's a phenomenal system it just works so well right and incredibly powerful to not have to to guess or just be your own uh, you know your own mirror on where to focus but to have you know a master as yourself kind of uh, you know will help you save time yeah I mean that's the whole point with teacher the teacher will bring their decades of knowledge 
to help a student say, you know, I could shave you five years of time if you just do it this way, right? You know, right. instead of the student just sort of struggling on their own to figure out what to do, the teacher is giving their uh, expertise and showing real efficiencies so that the whole point is that the student can learn faster than the teacher did. <laughs> right. Okay, so uh, here's a question. Um, again, you know, you mentioned the power of kind of recording videos and, and even watching yourself and then submitting them and getting that feedback. Bruce14 uh, just wrote in, um, I have difficulty recording anything that I feel is sufficient and high enough standard to submit for your criticism. In fact, watching my own video is daunting enough. How do I yeah. overcome this? <laughs> welcome to <laughs> welcome to yeah. the world. Yeah. You know what? There, there is a phenomenon, I think, with all musicians and students too, perfectionitis. You know, we're, we're so worried about being less than perfect and letting the world see our mistakes and foibles. And all I can say is, hey, uh, I, I know, I, I went through the same thing myself as a student, even as a professional, you know, and it's hard, you know, it, it break, grates against your ego because you want to look your best, right? But let me just encourage you, you know, you're going to learn from your mistakes. Your mistakes are going to be your best teachers. And so don't be intimidated. That's what we're all here for. And I think another really great thing about the Artist Works platform is that it's a community, not of people judging each other per se, but we're all welcome each other, having fun, learning together, and learning from each other. Mm -hmm. So um, if anything, don't try to make the perfect video exchange submission. This is what I tell my students. I'm sure the other teachers would agree. Don't worry about making the perfect, but put, get started, do something. Because if you're not showing your mistakes, your teacher has no idea how to help you. So think of it that way. Right. You want to show your mistakes, how you're doing it wrong, what you're struggling with, so that you can start the dialogue and that your teacher can really give the help that we're able to give. You know, I want to encourage more people to submit more video exchange submissions. Don't be afraid. Yes, we're all intended, but I've got news for you. Most of us were not, are not going to go into, get into Carnegie Hall. We're just doing this for fun, right? right? And for those of us who are going to go into Carnegie Hall, you still need to submit your mistakes so that you can get better. You know, I had a teacher who was one of the most phenomenal musicians, amazing intellect, incredible technique, and he would give a concert, and we all go up to him and say, oh, that was fantastic, and he would go, ah, yeah, no, I, I, you know, I missed this, I missed that, and we students would be looking at each other like, what is he talking about? It was so wonderful. And I, I think the thing, the takeaway that I had was I started seeing he was really miserable. He was not happy. He always punished himself for not being perfect. And mm -hmm. so it affected me. I thought initially I had the same attitude. Oh, it's not good enough. I can't release it. It's not perfect. And then after a while, I was like, you know what? Life's too short. I want to enjoy this. I don't want to make myself miserable like my teacher did. Yeah. And so if anything, I make mistakes. I can laugh about it. That's, hey, it shows that I'm human too. But we, as long as you have the attitude that you're willing to learn from those mistakes. See, that's a huge difference too. I think a lot of folks, their perfectionitis or their fear of perfection prevents them from learning, prevents them from growing. It's when you embrace your mistakes and you say, you know what, I'm not perfect, but that's okay because I want to learn and get better. Wow, that's, it's almost like you're gonna open a door and start to see it's not as important, it's not as life-threatening as you were. You know, if, if you make a mistake in your instrument, nobody's gonna go into cardiac arrest. You're not, you're, nobody's gonna, you're, you're not inflicting bodily harm, you're not inflicting permanent damage to anybody but your own ego, right? Right. <laughs> and, and the point is, that one of the, all the cool things is what I've seen from student after student their first videos are all a bit, you know, a, a bit awkward, you know, and they're all nervous. But it's always incredible that after a while working together, I can point that point out the first videos they, they they submitted, full of mistakes and this and that, and you can see, wow, look at your progress, and that can be also a huge incentive. So go ahead, put up your your video exchange full of bloopers because I guarantee you, once you do that and do it on a regular basis. Six months, six months from now, a year from now, you're going to look back and say, wow, I'm so glad I did this because now I can see how much I've improved since then. So think of it that way too. Right. That's great.
So you made it, I like the point you made there about we're not all going to be playing Carnegie Hall. You know, I like that. Uh, so that can apply to a lot of, I see how that could apply to other parts of someone's playing as well. Not beating yourself up, not going too hard on yourself, allowing yourself to put, put your personality into the piece. At what point does that attitude where do you find the balance there? Because I could also see someone posture or hand technique and, hey, I'm just having fun. I'm not going to play Carnegie Hall. But then you can really start building bad habits. So so where do you draw the line there? And what are some of these basics that, hey, you're not going to play Carnegie Hall. This really is something important to focus on. Now. You know, I think the best analogy would be any kind of sport or hobby that you take on. And um, yes. Certainly, we're, if we're doing this for fun, have fun. That's the number one priority. Now, I'll, and I will purposely tell my students, just play, show me, you can play whatever you want. Now, every once in a while, I'll see a student coming in and they're having some difficulty. And so that's where I can step in and say, listen, if you practice it this way, it'll make it easier for you. You will enjoy it more because you'll get it more consistently. So, Listen, it's really up to you. I mean, you can if you're having fun, having a blast, and you don't want to change, and it works for you, kudos. That's fine. And everybody's body is different. So maybe, and I'm a short guy, and someone who's really, really tall, they're going to have different posture issues that I may not be able to address as well as somebody else. And maybe they can make it work for them. But um, at the same time, I would always, uh, for all the students, come into your lessons with a really open mind. You know, instead of just defaulting what's comfortable, be open to the possibility that, you know, if you know if I apply this, I might be able to play that faster. I might play, be able to play that lick more comfortably, and it's worth the investment because later on you're going to go back and say, "Wow, how could I have done it the old way before?" So yeah. it's a great, and it's it's like um, you know, I, I would go running. I used to. I've got to get back to it. I used to run a lot. And mm -hmm. when I got started, I wanted to know all the techniques, and I started researching four-foot running techniques, and it was fun. You know, I started watching videos and getting advice, and because I wanted to make my runs less exhausting, less painful, and so in that application, getting the advice to change and work on my technique, I could see real benefits to ch changing the way I would run or land my foot or this or that or breathe. You know, and so. Uh -huh. you know, but if I was just going to say, nope, this is the way I'm going to run, I don't care, that's fine too. Don't expect to get faster. Don't expect it to get easier. But if you're having yeah. fun, great. But more often than not, you know, when that running analogy, once you get hooked on the, the, the learning bug, you start to say, you know, I bet I could do that better. I bet I could run a little faster. I bet I could play that lick a little faster. Uh, yeah. I mean, even with cooking, you know, you know so... My latest obsession, like for my for my friends who are following me on Facebook, my latest obsession is artisan breads. And you know, I used to bake breads a long time ago, and I just just follow the recipe, this or that. And now, I, as I'm learning more and more, I'm like, wait a minute, I, I'm not satisfied with using the instant yeast packet. Now I want to make my own yeast. Uh, and now later on, I want, I want to see if I can make some gluten-free sourdough breads. And so I'm getting a little crazy here. But the point is, once I've mastered something, then I start to realize I need a new challenge because I want to keep growing make new things. It's just, you know what? Life is so exciting. There is so much to learn and enjoy. Look, some people are happy with getting to a certain level and settling and relax. That's great. Hey, if you're happy, go for it. So other people like me, we, we get restless. We get bored. They're like, wait a minute, this is too easy. I, I need a new challenge. <laughs> because as you grow, you, you know, for me, it's, it's interesting. It, when I find myself in a situation where I'm nervous or I'm a little afraid, that's the perfect place to be because then I know I'm right in the place where I am stretching myself beyond my own capabilities. Yeah. I am putting myself in harm's way in a sense that, oh, there's a risk here. I could really mess up or this could not come out right. But that's the only place where I'm going to learn. If I'm stuck back here playing the same thing and not taking the time to learn anything new, I'm not going to grow. I'm not going to experience new levels of living, new levels of enjoying, new levels of appreciation, you know? And so I always, for me personally, I always, I, I used to be afraid of being afraid. Now it's like, hey, this is a great opportunity for me to stretch myself and get even better and, and, and improve myself. And what a thrilling place to be. And this is something I, will, I hope all the students 
get a taste of that. Like, hey, it's okay to make a mistake because I'm afraid, I'm nervous in front of the camera. Good, that's the place to be because that's the place where you are going to grow and experience new levels of living. It's great, be there. Yeah, that's really great, that's beautiful. Uh, I, yeah, I once had a professor tell me, um, be comfortable being uncomfortable because, and that always stuck with me. I mean, I was told that, you know, 10 plus years ago, that always stuck with me because when you do what we do, or if you're in music or any sort of live performance, or I mean, even right now, you know, we have people watching us live, you're gonna get into these situations and to learn to embrace them and thrive in them, that's exciting and getting out of your comfort zone and it keeps you going back for more, you know? And, and when your heart's racing, you're alive, that's a good thing. If your heart's not <laughs> racing, your heart's not beating, you're dead. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a nice reminder, it kind of reminds me why people like to eat hot sauce. You know, it, it, yeah. It's spicy. It gets their you know blood boiling, and for a lot of folks, it's that thrill that they they feel alive. <laughs> more alive. Yeah. Eating that hot sauce or eating something that challenges their taste buds. I'm not recommending everybody eat hot sauce, but <laughs> it's the same kind of thing where you know it's okay to to try this. And, and I just want to congratulate all the students that are part of the school. You've taken steps to grow. You've taken yeah. steps to reach out to to people who really care about you. I mean. Yes, I'm an art. I'm, I'm so I'm so lucky to be working in collaboration with some of the best musicians around. And to a person, we all have this heart. You know, we get excited when our students get excited. When we can inspire them to, no matter their level, when we can inspire them to to fall in love what we fall in love with, everybody wins. It's amazing. So yeah, yeah, that's great. That's great. All right. So uh, the next question comes in from um, Ralph B. And uh, he's just wondering, so do you have any hand uh, or other physical exercises you would recommend to improve dexterity? Improve dexterity, hmm, that's a really good one. So um, I, I don't know if you can see this, I actually have a series of exercises um, on my school, the, the popular piano school site and the forums. Um, these were a series of exercises. Unfortunately, I can't set up my overhead cam here, but I'll try to explain how this works. These were a set of exercises that were developed by Rudolf Serkin, who was a very famous classical pianist who died a number of years ago. But uh, he uh, came up with this warm-up exercise. My old teacher, Susan Starr, taught them to me, and I found that to be, wow, these are great because they exercise every single finger, but in a, in a kind of a tricky way so that you can get comfortable with the, the dexterity of each finger individually, and it strengthens each finger um, individually as well. So here, I'm going to just try to show you. What's going to happen is you're going to play one, three, two, four, and then three, five, okay? Mm -hmm. Kind of alternate fingers. But let me show you how the exercise works. I'm gonna just do one hand first. One, three, two, four, go back and forth, and then five, three, five, three, four, two. I'm making it look easy. Just looks easy. It's hard if you've never done this before, I mean, just, coordinating between different alternating sets of fingers is hard. You do the, and then what you do is you do the opposite. You actually do the same sets of fingers for both hands. So one, three, one, three, two, four, two, four, five, three, five, three. So it goes like this. See that? And then what you do is you move through different modes. So that was major. Then you go to minor. Diminished. Well, not really diminished. It's kind of a seventh. Then you go up the next half step. So on and so forth. You go through all the keys like that. Man. It's a simple mm -hmm. exercise in terms of once you, it's kind of tricky, but once you get it, you work through all the keys. So the, the, the thing to do with that kind of an exercise is as you're doing this, don't bounce your arms, don't, don't, don't stress your, your wrists or anything. It's all in the fingers. That is going to increase your dexterity like nothing. Boy, this is a good basic strength builder and dexterity builder. So one of the best warm-up exercises as well as dexterity building exercises that I know. Very cool. And 
Remind the students where they can find that on your school. You said it's in the forums somewhere? It's in the forums, right. You look into the general section and then look for sheet music, or just do a search for the term Serkin, S-E-R-K-I-N, Serkin. And it's the, the exercises are labeled Serkin exercises. All right, great. Check those out, guys. Those, that looks difficult. I, I'll admit, I was sitting here under the desk kind of trying it. I was, that's, that's harder than it looks. Yeah, it's funny. <laughs> you know, it's funny you mentioned that. I've actually done this in the hotel where yeah. I'm away from the piano, and I actually will do this. Try it on a table, tabletop. Yeah. I don't know if you can hear this. You want it, you don't want it to kind of uh, crunch around unevenly. You want it a solid hit on all four fingers at the same time. Mm. So try it on a tabletop. How loud can you pound that on a table? Come on, John, give it a try. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear that. But, you know, <laughs> that's really interesting that that organically came up because my next question was from Nicholas uh, Figueroa, and his question was, do you have any tips for practicing away from the keyboard? Yeah, just the one I just showed you. <laughs> yeah, so you can do this. You can be on the bus and be practicing this. Absolutely, and that, that's one example. Again, it just it keeps you, it strengthens your fingers, keeps them warmed up. I mean, obviously, you can kind of go through your piece. You can you know put put your table and pretend to go through that. And there have been some some interesting pianists in the past who have cut out paper keyboards and and practice on them when they were in situations where they couldn't afford to have a piano or in um, situations that were too, they they weren't allowed to have a piano. But so you can still practice or go through the motions of your piece in the air, you know, and really imagine. Oh, so here's another really funny thing. When I was a student, I would, you know, I would be so busy that I would try to maximize my time by mentally practicing my pieces as I was walking between buildings. One day, I was going through a particularly difficult piece in my mind, practicing it in my head, and I came to the spot that I always made a mistake at, and I made the mistake in my mind. I'm like, wait a minute, there's no piano here. Why am I making that mistake? Wow. That shocked me. It made me realize, oh my goodness, I'm playing with the expectation I'm going to make a mistake. That and that was one of the things that really rocked my world to realize I was I was it, participating in my own mistakes. So this may be a good exercise, purposely get away from your instrument. Can you imagine playing it perfectly? Mm. Or do you find yourself stopping in the same places, hesitating in the same place? If you are, you're not even touching your instrument, you know that's a spot you need to work on mentally as well as physically. It's, it's absolutely fascinating how our brains, you know, how if we really take the time to analyze how we think, we can solve a lot of those problems away from our instruments too. So give that a try. I challenge that folks that are working on their songs, see if you're like mentally automatically hesitating at this spot or that spot. Yeah. It'd be really, really interesting to see the feedback on that. That's fascinating. That's a, that's a hardwired mistake right there. That's well, you, it, you it is. A habit to make that mistake. Exactly. And this is again kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of the whole practicing. You know, if you're just spending an hour doing the same thing, guess what? You're building those neural pathways to be grooved to play a certain way. And those group those it's those pathways are not are are physical in terms of the execution, but also physical in terms of your mental channels, your memories. And so a, a lot of practicing is really conscious of reprogramming or making new pathways so that you think of your piece differently. Think about that. Yeah. So it's so that's why it's so important. Go back to 10 minutes so that you're not re kind of channeling the old mistake pathways, but you're mm -hmm. taking the time to start chipping away, building the new pathways to redirect the activity to go the right way. Very interesting. Very interesting. Cool. Cool. Okay, so this one is from Lydia, and uh, she is asking, do you think there is a preferred time of day to practice? Yeah, well, that's a great question. You know, it uh, it, it's going to vary from people, person to person. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, in professional circles, many times, um, oh, let, me, let me start off with this. Uh, I knew of a professor who used to do all of his practicing really early in the morning. I mean, like 5 a.m., he'd be practicing his scales, which is, in theory, is great. It's, it's actually, I mean, you know, science has shown that um, we do our best learning first thing in the morning, 
okay? So that, that's what he was, I think he was trying to take advantage of that. The problem was, as he got older, he got so tired by the time it was time to play a show at night, uh -huh, yeah. he, was, <laughs> he, would, he would lose focus. And he, he, so he, while he was practicing at the right time to learn something, he wasn't practicing at the right time to perform. Again, so that's a very interesting situation where he, he was practicing but not really optimizing the proper performance clock, if you will. So again, this is an interesting situation for performers, now, especially if you're playing situations where you're no, more normally going to be performing late at night, you're going to want to train to at the time that you're optimally going to be called on to do that for the, for the most part. Now, I'm not sure what percentage of our artist work students are in actively gigging or actively performing. I would just keep that in mind. If you're going to be, you know, if you are, if you're making a livelihood or, or making a few extra bucks by playing your music, I would recommend at least one session being at the time that you're going to be called on to perform. If you're going to be called to perform at one o'clock in the morning. Guess what? You need to practice at one a.m. as tired as you are. I mean, there's a reason why in medical school they have their interns. Uh, have these ridiculous shifts where they're called on overnight to, to, to work all night long. Why? Because doctors need to stay frosty and mentally aware and sharp to perform their medicine at any hour of the day because there are going to be emergencies, right? And so the right. same thing can apply for music. Now, for the for folks who are learning just for fun, I would recommend the morning. The morning's a great time because you're fresh, your brain is most, uh, you, you, you don't have anything else cluttering your brain. And if this is something you really have a high priority on, do this as early in the morning as you can. That would be my recommendation. But as I said, if you, let's say, you know, you're always going to be playing for your friends at such and such an hour. Well, add in or, you know, make that practice time that hour that you're going to be most expected to perform as it were. But if you're not in a performance situation, check, try the morning. But, but, but think about why that works that way. It's a pretty interesting, that's a great question, by the way. Right. Or if you're a, a busy parent or work long weeks, just practice whenever you can. You might uh, let me, let me just throw in something with that. You know, it's interesting because um, some of what I do with my students, I actually recommend them instruments. One of the great advantages of some of the newer instruments that are coming up, I know Yamaha is making these amazing acoustic pianos. You push the button and it silences the, the acoustic piano. You plug in headphones. And then you can hear the digital piano. So if you want to have the benefits of both a beautiful acoustic piano and the benefits of being able to make it quiet, they call them the silent pianos. You can get them in upright or grand versions. So you want to look for maybe silent piano so that, yeah, if you have kids and they need to sleep at night and you want to practice when they're asleep, shut off, the, you know, silence the piano, plug your headphones in, then you can practice virtually without bothering anybody. Of course, people with digital keyboards can do this at any time too, but you know, if you were, there's just some cool, cool options. If you're thinking of upgrading and you still want the ability to practice at any hour of the night, check out some of the hybrid pianos available from, from manufacturers like Yamaha. It's a really, really terrific option. Yeah, and if you want to hear a good sample of what those sound like, we, we've used those with you in the studio here. Yeah? That's right. Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. It sounded awesome. So. Very cool. Um, okay, so this one comes from Philly Mike, who is an artist work student, but he's not a student of your school. He's he's wondering. He says, "I just have a Yamaha P95 keyboard. Would I be able to join your class?" Absolutely, yes. Please, that'd be fantastic. Yes. So yeah, look, I've I've. It doesn't matter what keyboard you have. I, I, it's interesting. I've had students join with like extra small keyboards, and they wanted to work in pieces that were written for notes that extend beyond that. Guess what? I, I was showing them shortcuts on what to leave out so they could fit on mm. their keyboard. Yes, by all means. If you have black and white keys, doesn't matter how many you have. Well, I mean, if obviously if you only have like, you know, two or three, we're going to be a little problem. But absolutely, cool. you know, these little keyboards, that's no problem, you know? And, and I, would, I would welcome you. It's a great place to start. And, and I totally understand for a lot of folks, who are not sure if they're going to stay with it. They don't want to invest a lot of money because they're not sure. Get what you can afford. Get a keyboard. Get started. Because I guarantee you, coming to, coming to uh, our schools, but yeah, I think my school in particular, you are going to have so much fun. You're going to fall yeah. in love. And, and, and we'll do the best we can to make the, mu the best music out of whatever you have. Now, I'll, I'll preface this by saying this. Well, I, I'm not preface is not the right word. but. Let me just add this uh, because what I've been seeing recently, as I've had some students with me for a long period of time, they started out on you know 
uh, smaller keyboards or uh, cheaper keyboards, which is fine. I totally welcome that. And on their own, they're starting to play at such a high level that they're like, you know what? I, now they, I see why I need a better keyboard. And they go out and you know they'll contact me, get some recommendations, or they'll just go out and get something on their own. And the, it, they get so excited because now they can appreciate they have the skills to really sound good. And when you have a great instrument, you sound even better. And if you don't really have the skills, getting a super expensive keyboard, it's not going to make much of a difference. It's when you have the skills that you're like, OK, I think it's time for a new guitar. I think it's time for a new, you know, new maybe a piano, a real piano. Because then you'll, you'll know enough to really appreciate what's good, what's excellent, what's terrific. And so yeah. it's exciting. But again, no pressure. Come with what you have. We'll work with you, and, and you're going to have fun with your instrument. I'm just warning you, you may fall in love to the point where you're like, yeah, I think it's time for a new keyboard. And that'll be OK, too. <laughs> you heard it here, Philly, Mike. There's, you're out of excuses now. It's time yeah, for you. Hey, yeah. come on. Come to, we're going to have fun. Don't, don't matter what you have, come on. We're going to have fun, have a great time. And I'm not going to pressure you to upgrade your keyboard. It will make you sound good in whatever you play. Right. I've seen it firsthand. Uh, Hugh's great at working with anybody of any skill level on any keyboard or piano who wants to learn any tune. I've seen it done. He can do it. Yeah, and so what's really cool too is, like I said, with some of the situations where the students have keyboards that are smaller, it gives an opportunity for me to teach how to arrange a piece. How can you change? See, sometimes we think, oh, a song can only be played one way. It's not true. You can actually <laughs> modify any piece of music to fit your hands, fit the keyboards, and that helps me to show that music, it, you know, it's like it's like clay. You can shape it any way you like, and we can make it fit whatever instruments you have, whatever hand size you have. Some people have really, really small hands, and I can teach them ways to make it sound big without having to hurt themselves. We can, we can find creative ways to readjust the notes so that it still sounds good while still maximizing um, their capabilities within what they can do. Very cool. Hey, so Hugh, when we were kind of prepping for this thing, I, I gave you a little warning. I might be asking you to play a tune for us. I might have even asked you to have two prepared, but I don't remember. But if, if you have one ready, would you mind playing another little tune for us? Just yeah, absolutely. In fact, can you give me like five seconds? I'm looking at my, I just realized, I forgot to plug my computer in. Do I have five seconds to run and get my power cord and plug it in? I'm down to like 30%. What do you think? Let's do it. Maybe we can. You know what? Let's let's go on. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna live life on the edge. I'm gonna be dangerous. Hey. We have 15 minutes left, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is what this is what they call in the industry stretching. So if I need to stretch, well, you know. All right, let's give it a try. <laughs> if, I start, if I start to hit 10, percent I'm gonna run out and get my power cord. How about no that? No problem. No problem. Okay, so did you want to play a, a little tune for us? Sure, or? okay, I'm going to go and, and play another song. For those of you who missed the first selection, I'm, it's going to be another selection from the Nutcracker Suite. Again, get us in the holiday mood. How about the holiday mood? Let's do this. Extra bonus points for anybody who can recognize the title of this piece.
Are we, feeling, are we feeling like in the holiday mood now? We're ready. Oh, yeah. I am for sure. Ready for the holidays? So do I get? Do I get a shot at the extra bonus points? You that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is good that uh, that's Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy, right? Ding, 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 ding! You got it. Very yeah. good. Yeah. Very cool. Enough, huh? Can I just say one thing? Sure. One thing I love about music, you look like you're having so much fun when you play that that piece. I I wish I could play it. Come to my school and I'll teach you. <laughs> You know, it was funny. I was just at a salon last night, oh, yesterday. Uh -huh. The salon is where um, people get together, we play music, and it was interesting because I was, I was helping to organize it. We had a, had a bunch of musicians. They started to play, and everybody was sitting down and trying to listen to them as an audience. I'm like, no, stop, get up, relax, come on. The whole point is to have fun. Stop yeah. treating this like a concert. I mean, I baked some bread. I was serving bread with my garlic butter. You know, hey, try Ooh. my bread. Let's have a little bit of wine. Let's make some music. Hey, if, I was inviting people. If you don't play or you want to sing something, bring some sheet music. We were reading Broadway tunes. Somebody was singing some opera. We we're playing some, you know, some pop songs. We were having so much fun. I was sight reading stuff and making mistakes everywhere. I'm like, that's okay. Music is so much fun. And I think we get so worked up by not being good enough. And yesterday was a great example of people, when, we, when I gave them permission, we say, stop, we're not performing. We're here to have a good time and yeah. just read through stuff and just enjoy. Boy, everybody, everybody had a blast. And so I want to encourage all of you guys, get together with your friends. Jam, read, have some yeah. fun, yeah. play your tunes. Don't get so worked up about perfectionitis, performanitis, don't, you know, it, it, you were missing out the point, you know, and I, I we need way more fun in, in making music uh, fun and entertaining and just something to get together. And anybody can do this, no matter what you're playing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's yeah, some there's pieces some that I've learned where, where hearing the hearing recording them. of it on an album or something, you love it, but I, I never had the desire to learn it. But then one day I actually sat and watched somebody play it. It's like, man, that looks so much fun. And then it, it kind of changes the way you hear it and it makes you really want to learn it. You know, there's something to be said for that. That's a really good point, Sean. And I think another really interesting thing is where, um, again, a lot of it is, oh, I can never do that. Yeah. And it's interesting uh, when I've seen people, they j I just showed them maybe the first few notes of a song, they're like, oh, wow. They're not even playing the whole song, but yeah. maybe just the first few notes. And this magic, almost electricity goes through them. Like, Wow, that's the song, and they almost feel like a whole new level of engagement with it. And, and many times, I fall, they'll fall in love with the idea of playing because just from the first few notes, they're like, "Wait, I know that. That's what it sounds like." And they, it's so exciting because it's it's completely different. You know, it's a little bit like uh, for me, the example is like watching Food Network or some food TV and seeing some really gorgeous dish, and you're like, well, "Oh yeah, that looks great." <laughs> Wait till you taste it. Oh my goodness. You know, then it changes your world, right? So you yeah. can sit back and just watch other people do it, but wouldn't it be great to actually go out and taste it and then learn to cook it for yourself? Wow. That's what we're all about, right? That, Bringing that's that's a, oh, yeah. The cooking analogy is a great one because on a lot of those networks, it's like. Whoops. Are we still there? Uh, we got a little. I'm sorry, we had a little bit of lag. I didn't hear your, you were mentioning the saying on, on these cooking networks, it was, and I lost oh, it. Oh, yeah, yeah, so you can see these, these delicious dishes that look so beautiful, but it's like, yeah, but I could never make that. But then when you see it broken down, simple yeah. recipe, here's how much of this, here's when to do that, it's a lot like learning a piece. Yeah, and you know what, the first few times, you're, you're, you're going to mess up. So you can either say, oh, I can't, I can't, I'll never do it. Same thing for me when I was baking breads. I, I can't tell you how many times I forgot the salt. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I put in way too much flour. It came out like a rock or like a bagel or something like a, like a brick bagel. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you keep trying it, and eventually you, you learn from those mistakes. And, you know, you, you come up with these dishes or you come up with a piece that sounds really good, that tastes amazing. You know, it takes practice. But trust me, the journey is part of the fun. And, again, you have to be able to laugh at yourself. If you can't laugh at yourself, you take yourself too seriously, I can't help you. <laughs> right. But if you're willing to admit you're human, I'm a human, we're going to make mistakes, but those mistakes will teach us and grow us, you, there is nothing that can stop you 
from really achieving your musical dreams, your life dreams. I am a, I, and I, I see this over and over again. Let your mistakes propel you, guide you, teach you, inspire you yeah, to yeah. for a better future. That's great. That's great. I don't know how don't we know. Uh, got here so fast, but we only have about nine minutes left. So uh, I'm going to try to get to a couple more of these questions. Thank you guys so much for sending them in. There's been some really great topics getting brought up, and uh, I'm very thankful for you guys being so uh, so active in, in this conversation. Um, so Dennis Ray is asking, uh, what is the best way to improve one's sight reading skills? Ah, yeah, that's, so, yeah. that's a great – I get this all the time. Now, so um, I remember – I still remember when I was in elementary school and being asked to join the jazz band. And it was the most terrifying thing because I had to sight read music. I, I, oh, it was horrifying. <laughs> terrifying. And then jump forward to today where – I'm not, guess what? I was sight reading this last piece. I haven't practiced it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, the simple answer is it, it takes practice. So the more you read, the more fluent you will become. So uh, what I encourage you to do and everybody to do is to, to, to get music that's roughly your level and commit yourself to reading a new line every day. Every day, okay? And just practice reading. It doesn't matter what the mistakes are. And here's here are two exercises. Number one, read new music every day. Pick something a little easier than what you're normally playing, but get a metronome on. Mm. And play with that beat. And here's the thing. Don't try to play every note. The most important thing is to stay on the beat. So even if you miss a note, just play the beat, the note that's on the next beat, and get in the habit of letting notes go and just always moving forward. That's another critical skill. Too many, and I, I know many professional musicians that have a hard time sight reading. They're so used to, oh, I make a mistake, then they go back and replay what they missed. But when you're playing and sight reading in time, you, ha you have to keep moving forward. You've got to let those mistakes go and just always look ahead and forget about the past, so to speak. Yeah. So try that exercise of getting a metronome on, playing something, even if it's just one, if it's for a piano, if it's just one hand, do both hands alone or something, or even both, both hands together, something a little simple, but read, read in time, and mm -hmm. don't worry about what you missed. Okay? So those are two exercises. Read something and every, new every day, and read something simple, but in time, and learn to let go of the notes that you've missed. So that's, you're going to have to get a lot of music to, to read through that. So yeah. you know, read through, um, go out, to, you know, I mean, there's so many things on the internet now. You go to IMSLP which is a great imslp.org, which is a great site for getting free you know, public domain music. Mm -hmm. Free! That's pretty amazing. Other sites where you can get access to other songs as well. Musicnotes.com, you can get simple versions of, of all songs, songs for all different instruments. You read, 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 read. Just make it a daily habit to read something new every day. That's great. That's great. Thank you for those Thank resources. You for those resources. I know that um, sight reading can be a very intimidating uh, thing to approach as a musician. So and I'll tell you. I mean, listen. I was intimidated for years. It's the hardest, hardest thing for me to learn. And it was really when I became the director of instrumental accompaniment that I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know any of this music. I had to learn on the job. Believe it or not. I mean, I, I played some things, but then suddenly I was responsible for being able to play everything. And so that meant I was being thrown music every day. I'd have hundreds of pages to play through. And the miraculous thing was when I was in that pressure cooker, scary situation, I, my sight reading improved like crazy. Mm. I was in that zone of fear. I was scary. But you know, I could either get scared and back off or dive in and just live with the fear and just move forward. And it was, it was amazing. After about a few years of being in the, in the fire, so to speak, it became the easiest thing. new piece of music. Great! Hey, I want to I want to read something. I'm getting bored. Give me something new to read. <laughs> you actually start to get an appetite for reading new stuff. And I actually became one of the leading experts for composers would write new pieces, and they asked me to come read their piece <laughs> so they could hear how it sounded. You know. Oh, that's great. Yeah, you know, I worked with some some great composers, some some Pulitzer Prize winning composers, and other people as well, where they called me up and I you know, I'll read through something. 
so that it, they can get a sense of the timing and how it sounds. And that's that. My skill level got to the level where I I can read anything. Oh, I've got some horrible stories. <laughs> do we have time for a really quick story, or do we have yes, another? Yes, question? Sure, sure. Okay, super, we're super quick quote story. Uh, so uh, one time there was a certain orchestra. I'm not going to name which one it was. Um, they called me up at uh, three o'clock in the afternoon, asking if I could fill in for somebody who was not able to play the concert that night. Like you're kidding me, really? So get the music to me as soon as you can. I said, okay, we're going to get the music to you. They called me back 15 minutes later and said, oh, don't worry about it. We found somebody else. Whew, I'm off the hook, right? Oh, so I was going to tell my students the story of how I almost played with such and such an orchestra on the day of a concert. So I'm getting ready to go home. 7 o'clock, I get another phone call. It's the orchestra. The show's going to start in an hour. They're like, the person bailed on us. Get over here real fast. I'm like, oh, man. You're kidding me. So I didn't even have the music. I'm sight reading on stage with one of the best orchestras in the world. I'm like, whoa, this is insane. Wow. <laughs> well, that's, it. that's another example. Live in fear and persevere. Hey, I like that. Live in fear and persevere. How about that? We'll that's make that cool. a new meme. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Well, that's, that's really great, and uh, thank you so much for that. Thank you so much for this conversation. Uh, I just want to say really quickly, you have an anniversary coming up next month. It'll be two years that you've been teaching here at Artist Works. How about that? Two years already? Boy, time just flies. Yeah, and I don't even, I, I haven't checked lately to see how many uh, video exchanges you've done, but you are just not only such an incredible performer, absolutely incredible performer sight reader etc but you just just as talented if not more as as an instructor and oh, I've seen you. a lot of people get get a lot better uh, exchanging videos with you and the way that you allow people of any skill level to approach any tune that they want to learn that's going to get them fired up to learn it's really incredible so thank you so much for everything you do for, uh, on behalf of all your students I'm, I'm sure I just thank you so much well, you know, again, it, I'll tell you honestly, more than playing on the stage of Carnegie Hall, and I played both in the small recital hall and the main hall several yeah. times, more than traveling around the world, more than playing on TV, my biggest thrill, believe it or not, is when somebody comes to me and says, oh, I, I could never play the piano. I, I wanted to play the piano all my life. I could never do it as a kid. I could never. And then I, they give me a chance to work with them. And the joy, I mean, the absolute joy that comes and the excitement and the discovery, like, I can do this. For me, that thrill beats everything else. To see another person who didn't believe in themselves with just a little bit of instruction and a, and a, you know, a little bit of encouragement to help them discover, yes, you can. You all can learn. It just takes time. It takes a good teacher. But the most important ingredient to, for, to be able to learn anything is love. You have to love the song you want to learn. You have to love music. If the love isn't there, you know, you can probably get there with a certain level. So once again, you need time, teacher, and love. The love is the most important ingredient for any kind of success and whatever you endeavor to do, particular, particularly in music. Great. Well, that thrill you describe, I've had the pleasure of watching you give that thrill to many students over the last couple of years. So thank you so much for everything you've done here at ArtistWorks. And uh, I just want to say really quickly, uh, congratulations to Joy Madrak, who um, asked uh, not only, not one, but I think actually two really great questions that made it into our conversation today. So, Joy, you are getting a three-month extension added wow, to Wow, congratulations. Hey, thank you, everybody, for the great questions and yeah, for participating. This was yes. terrific. Wow. Yes. And thank you again, Hugh, for uh, some great performances and some really uh, and some interesting conversation as well. Oh, thanks, John. It's great to talk to you. Yep. And so this has been another Artist Works Live, and we'll, we'll see you all next month. Thank you for joining in.